Happiness is beautiful It's a kind of reality Happiness is the highest good Happiness is free So let's be so very happy Yeah, let's be so very happy Yeah, let's be so very happy Welcome to The Happiness Show. This is George Ortega, and I'm here to talk about happiness, because happiness is, always has been, and always will be the point of it all. Tonight we're going to begin a series of shows called Ways of Becoming Happier. This will be Ways of Becoming Happier number one, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through recommendations, uh, strategies, and considerations related to happiness that, um, that basically are gleaned from the research. Um, you know, psychologists have studied happiness for about 40 years, and they've come up with a lot of um, information that really is valuable to know to, uh, to help us enhance our level of happiness. Okay, the first one uh, I'd like to go through is the, the value of smiling. Um, it's, it's, this, this is kind of an interesting uh, consideration. Um, this goes back to Darwin, actually. Um, it's kind of intuitive to think that what happens is like something happens and then we'll smile or we'll frown in relation to whatever happens. But then Darwin thought that, well, maybe the reverse is actually true. Maybe what happens is like we'll express ourselves, we'll smile or frown and then feel the emotion. So back in, in the uh, 70s, um, a man named James Laird, um, a psychologist, finally tested out this hypothesis and what he, what he did was he got people to smile and frown and all and then um, tested their, um, their level or their experience of emo emotion. So, um, so what, they, what he did determine was that when people smiled, uh, generally that leads to pleasant feelings and these feelings are, um, you know, last at least 10 minutes, half an hour sometimes. Um, it's kind of interesting though with this. Um, Something that tries to explain this I is of something that's called self-perception theory. And the idea here is that some people will, um, will smile and become, feel happier, while others, that may not necessarily work for. Um, it, there's kind of like a 50-50 split. So, uh, for example, like, let's say, um, s let's say someone goes to a party. If, if they're the kind of person that, that smiles and then feels better, just smiling will make them um, happier. However, uh, the 50% of us who respond um, to what's called external cues rather than internal cues will be at a party, and because we're at a party and that's supposed to be a kind of a situation where we're supposed to be happy, that will induce us to be happy in that way. So, um, so basically, um, while smiling is good advice for everyone, it hasn't yet been demonstrated that it, it is effective for everyone, although I, I would have to say that the experiments that have been conducted so far have only utilized smiling for five, ten minutes or so. Um, I think there's reason to believe that people who ordinarily respond to situations like parties with emotions can learn how to you know, make expressions like smiling and then feel the emotion. So, um, you know, you might want to try that. It, it, it's a, in, incredibly easy um, and it really works. Okay, um, the next point I want to go through is just um, the idea that, you know, happiness, happiness is the point of life. You know, this is, this is why we're here. Um, nothing is really more important. Um, we value goodness. You know, goodness is very important to us, but you know, goodness is valuable because it leads to happiness. Goodness is rewarded. You know, those, those of us who are religious will um, think of it in terms of God, God re rewarding us. Those of us who are more naturalists will believe that um, the nature rewards us, that, you know, when we do things rightly, um, we will uh, benefit and when we don't, uh, we'll somehow be punished in a sense. But, you know, keeping in mind that, that happiness is the point of life, can really um, set our priorities, can, can just really put everything into perspective. I mean, you know, we, we get involved in lots of things, in working, in, in um, spending time with people, and in different kinds of activities. And, you know, the, the purpose of all of them really is to enhance or maintain our level of happiness. But when we stay focused 
on happiness being the point, we won't get, we won't be distracted. You know, um, some of us might tend to work too much, or some of us might tend to um, become perfectionistic about our work, just having our work become more important than our, our actual experience and our feelings. So again, it, it's just very important to um, to just constantly recognize that happiness is the point of life, and then you know we can just really gear our, um, our activities and our thoughts and uh, our plans around that. Um, okay, the next consideration is something that's very important. Um, it's, um, it's the idea that happiness is dependent upon our thoughts. Um, this, this has its, its uh, precedent in what's known as cognitive therapy, the idea that um, events happen, and we don't just respond emotionally to events. There's a, a stage in between where we evaluate the, the event. For example, something happens, then we have a thought about that event, and then we, we um, experience the emotion. So, um, so really, happiness is an emotion, and it's dependent upon the kinds of thoughts we have. Um, when we realize that, we realize that we have a choice in, in what we think about a lot. Um, we can choose to think about our problems, our worries, what might go wrong, what isn't as good as it can be, or we can think about what is right, uh, the kinds of things that are going really well in our lives, uh, in, in the world. Um, again, uh, when we consider that happiness is dependent on our thoughts, we will um, we'll make the effort to, to both to in the present, you know, try to, to just have pleasant, happy thoughts, and also when we do that for an extended period of time, it, it becomes more natural. Um, in the first happiness increase experiments show that I did, um, Dr. Fordyce demonstrated that um, after th the training was done, um, some of his subjects continued to work on, on exercising the, the happiness thoughts and, and activities that le led to greater happiness. And they found that after a while, these habits and activities, these um, activities and thoughts became habit. So, so really, um, you know, just when we make, um, when we understand that, that happiness is dependent on our thoughts and make the effort to make um, pleasant thoughts a habit, after a while they'll, be they'll become second nature and we'll just, you know, much more easily um, feel much more pleasant um, more of the time. Okay. Um, Another consideration is actually one that um, I actually did a show on last week. It's the idea that, hap that uh, happiness is really greatly dependent on other people. Other people are generally our, our main source of happiness, our, our significant other. And um, that's very important to remember because uh, many of us are married or involved in relationships where we spend a lot of time with other people. and. Um, you know, when we recognize how, how important that person is to our happiness, we will uh, we'll make the effort to, to see that that relationship's good, to see that, um, that, it's, um, that we're doing our part to, um, to make the relationship as good as possible. A lot of times we'll spend, for example, eight hours working, we'll have hobbies that we'll devote our time to, and we'll just do a lot of other things. And um, sometimes we'll ignore those aspects of our life that um, that really, um, you know, are so influential to our happiness. So, um, so again, other people are very influential um, to our happiness, and and it's really good for us to um, to really keep that in mind. Okay, the next thing I'd like to um, talk about is the idea that. Um, that happiness is actually the highest good. This is something that Aristotle thought. He, he, he wrote a book actually um, based on it called um, Ethics. And, um, you know, um, again, many of us are, are very concerned with goodness. Uh, many of us are very religious, and to us our religion is really um, something that helps us become good, that teaches us right and wrong, and, and, and guides us in the ways of goodness. And um, so when you consider the idea that happiness is the highest good, that kind of would, would give us a certain kind of perspective that will, um, will help us to, to not, not kind of like sometimes become martyrs, because sometimes there's an idea of being too good. 
you know, sometimes we'll try to be very good and, and then suffer, like deprive ourselves, deny ourselves cer certain things that may not be necessary to deny ourselves of. of. And, um, and when we're aware of that, when we w are aware that happiness is the highest good, we'll not only, I think, um, be sure that the kind of goodness we're engaged in leads to happiness, but also when we, when we raise our kids, you know, our children, um, we'll, we'll teach them not just to be um, good in terms of like doing good in school and, and you know, being good in the ways, tr the traditional ways, but also in, in being good in the sense of being happy, you know, and in being, being very happy. Um, okay, um, what I'm going to do now is a song, and um, let's see, uh, during uh, my last show, Conversations in Mind, there was a song that uh, came on at the beginning of the end, and I, I played a couple of stanzas of it, and so now I'm going to do the whole song. It's called, um, It's a Matter of Time. Okay. Differences come not to matter And true friendship is what we will find The dreams of yesterday Are on their way to coming in true The ways of old are fast becoming new There are no reasons left to wait long for this destiny It won't be long before it happens Just you wait and see It's just a matter of time Until we all do trust one another Until truth holds each sister and brother and the world really learns how to rhyme It's just a matter of time Until goodness is all we will find Until hearts know the secrets of heaven And pour all their love out like wine The dreams of yesterday Are on their way to come in true Ways of old are fast becoming new There are no reasons left To wait long for this destiny It won't be long before it happens Just you wait and see It's just a matter of time Until this is as it should be Until beauty commands every person And joy fills eternity It's just a matter of time Until heaven descends on the sun Until smiles are as countless as stars And we finally know How wonderful we really are Okay, um, let's see. Now the next, um, the next point I want to consider is one that we probably haven't thought of much. Um, we may never have actually heard of it before. Um, I learned about it back in 1983 by reading a book called Gateway to Happiness, who was written by a ra it was written by a rabbi, Rabbi Zelig Pliskin. And um, the idea is that we have an obligation to be happy. Um, we have an, an obligation to ourselves, to our friends, to our family, and to God. 
um, considering our obligation to God, it's like, you know, we were, we were made and we were given many blessings, uh, the blessings of friends and, and family and, and food and clothing and shelter, um, so many pleasures in life that we've been given. And the idea is that when we're not happy, it's as if we're rebelling against God. It's as if we're saying to him, well, no, it's not enough. What, what you've given us is just, you know, that, that I want more. And so, um, so really, um, happiness is an obligation in, in the sense of like thanking God for, for bestowing everything that, uh, that God has on, on us. Um, and it's an obligation really to our, to our friends and family. Um, when we're not happy, you know, we're not very pleasant to be around. We're not, um, you know, con feelings are contagious. When we're not happy, we're more apt to make those around us not happy. And, um, you know, nobody's going to appreciate that. Um, you know, we've got an obligation to really work on our, our, our moods, um, having a pleasant facial expression. Actually, um, one of the rabbis um, back centuries ago would, would say that, that, um, that one should constantly have a pleasant facial expression um, when being around people. Um, that's actually another kind of a, a saying that you find in etiquette books some, sometimes, just having a, a, a subtle smile. Um, so happiness really, you know, it's an obligation that, that, that we be happy, um, an obligation to our friends, families, and, um, and lastly, it's an obligation to ourselves. I mean, like, you know, we weren't, we weren't made to be martyrs. We weren't made to, to give our lives. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes um, situations call on us to give our lives, to give of ourselves. Many, many great heroes in the world have done that. And that's wonderful. You know, we've got much to be thankful for. Memorial Day's coming up, and um, we'll probably be thanking the soldiers who actually gave our lives for us. But in our everyday lives, generally, we, um, we have an obligation to feel happy, to not um, take on kinds of um, pains and, and, and struggles that, that would diminish our happiness. Um, so when you consider that happiness is an obligation, then it goes from being an idea that, that like, well, we're lucky, we're fortunate or if we're happy, to a matter of morality. You know, um, in other words, it's good to be happy. Um, it's, yeah, it's a corollary with happiness being the highest good. It's, um, if we want to be good people, part, a very important part of being a good person is to be happy, as happy as possible. So, um, so it really is good to consider um, happily, um, happiness as an obligation. Okay, um, the next point I want to consider is that um, when you think about it on a personal level, the only success that, uh, that we really need is happiness. Um, we take on many challenges, um, going to school, jobs, activities, being with friends, hobbies, projects. We, we, we like to keep active with many things, and sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. But those, those activities, in a certain sense, aren't all that important. I mean, you know, we have to be good at our jobs to keep working. We, um, we enjoy being good at what we do, but s sometimes things don't work out as we would like. Sometimes things aren't as good as we would like. Sometimes we fail altogether. And, um, and the idea of this is that, you know, that's not important. Um, the only success that is important is being very happy, being happy. Um, if we've succeeded at being happy, we've succeeded at, at everything. You know, um, it'd be great, sure, it's great to succeed at, um, at our job, perhaps getting promoted, um, being given greater responsibility. It, it's good to succeed in school, to, to really contribute to society. You know, there are many um, worthwhile efforts that, that we um, value su su succeeding with. But, but in terms of the, the overall importance of success to our personal lives, if we limit you know, our consideration of that simply to happiness, it, it simplifies our whole life. And, um, and we'll find that, yeah, if we succeed at, at being happy, we've, got, you know, we've gained it all. We, we've succeeded at um, that which is most important to succeed with. Okay, um, the next point I want to consider is the idea that um, the more we strive to become happier, um, the happier we're going to become. 
Um, Dr. Fordyce, um, again, you know, in that first experiment uh, demonstrated that um, after, after the, um, the experiment was over, some of the subjects continued on with the experiment, and uh, he found that the, the ones who um, devoted the most time and effort to increasing their happiness um, increased their happiness the most. Um, happiness is like anything, you know, it's like um, playing tennis, it's like um, playing video games, like writing, like, like any kind of a job we do, like cooking, it's like any kind of skill. The, uh, the more we work on it, the better we're going to get. You know, um, there are principles to happiness, there are techniques, there are skills, there are, you know, happiness um, simply requires understanding, like, like many things in life. And, um, you know, we, we strive to become happier, and we will become a lot happier. That's, that's something that, um, is, there's something interesting about this, actually, because there is a, a line of philosophy that, that has been, um, for hundreds of years, many people would consider, well, you know, happiness is really a blessing. It's something that, um, that we're fortunate if we have, and that some people would think, well, if we do address it directly, then that's a good way to lose it. You know, that, that used to be a very popular, well, not so popular, but um, philosophy that, that some people held. Um, fortunately, in the, in the late 70s, we began to, to experiment with increasing uh, happiness through training, through directly working to become happier, and we discovered um, that working on becoming happier is, is very effective. You know, so... Um, so that, that old philosophy that, you know, to, to seek happiness directly is, is to lose it really has been greatly disproven by, by science. Okay, um, this is something that I think is very important. Um, fear, anger, and sadness are our basic unpleasant emotions, okay? We've felt them throughout our lives, and um, sometimes we we think of them as, as being unavoidable, and to a, to a great extent, you know, you know this, isn't an this isn't a perfect world, we're not perfect ourselves, and, um, you know, I suppose we're going to feel a certain degree of each. But the idea here is that, um, that these feelings, fear, anger, and sadness, aren't really necessary. Um, take the case of sadness. Um, Sadness is necessary if we're infants. Um, when we're infants, we rely on our parents for our basic needs, for our food, for, for comfort, for nurturing, for everything we need. Uh, we rely on our parents, and often our parents don't know what we want, and naturally, since we're infants, we can't communicate verbally, so we resort to expressing feelings like sadness. So we'll become sad, then the parents will, um, you know, pay attention to, us, attention to us and determine what exactly it is that we're sad about and try to um, rectify the situation, try to help us with our, um, you know, with what we need. Now, what happens is uh, we're not infants anymore. We, um, we have language. We have ways of communicating our needs to people. So, you know, when, when we need something from someone, you know, all we really have to do is ask. And um, it's not really all that simple because um, a lot of times we're not really taught, you know, how to ask. This isn't something that we're taught in school or, or a lot of times at home. You know, sometimes asking is something that we're kind of uncomfortable with. But really, it is all that's necessary um, for us to, to get our way. Um, you know, often, um, you know, we, we don't have to become sad to, to express our needs to other people. Um, fear is another example. Um, fear is something that, you know, when, when we perceive a danger, we, a, a danger to ourselves, to something we value, to our lives, we, there's a kind of like an, an instic instinctual drive that, um, that operates within, within us. It's very primitive, and it basically activates our bodies. It, it gets certain um, mechanisms going more quickly. It, it energizes. It's kind of like fight or flight response. You know, our body becomes prepared for action. But we find that in our modern day world, there are very, very few circumstances that warrant that kind of unpleasant uh, emotional, physical reaction. So we might perceive um, cars along a road driving along and we have to cross the street. 
and we'll simply cross it. It's not, you know, we don't have to be fearful if we're careful. So the idea with fear is that it's really not necessary to feel fear to the extent that we exercise a suitable concern to be cautious. We, you know, as adults, and, you know, perhaps as children, um, fear might be a bit more um, necessary because they haven't learned so, uh, as much about the world. But for adults, you know, we pretty much know what's safe and what's not. And we can make um, determinations about how to act um, that are like cognitive, that are, that are dependent on our thoughts and not on these very un unpleasant um, primitive emotional reactions. Again, with anger. Anger, we, we feel anger when we think there's been an injustice committed. You know, it, we say, you know, um, anger really is about justice. We, it, it may not actually be an injustice, but that's how we perceive it. So we become angry, and anger has to do with aggression and with battle and all. But in our world today, we find really that, um, that anger is, is very rarely called upon. We, we have the uh, capabilities, our, our language, our communication skills, um, our sophistication in culture really allows us to address situations without resorting to, to the, the primitive angry emotional response. Okay, so, so it's very important to, to recognize that um, these, these emotions, fear, anger, and sadness, which are, you know, very unpleasant, um, really are, are not necessary. We can really negotiate our ways through life without having to resort to them. Okay, well, that's all we have time for tonight. Thanks for watching. In the future, we'll explore other topics designed to help us better enjoy life. This is George Ortega saying, be good, think well, feel very happy, and I hope you'll join me again next week here on The Happiness Show. Happiness is powerful, it's our own divine need. Happiness is why we live each day, happiness is destiny. So let's be so very happy. Yeah, let's be so very happy. Yeah, let's be so very happy.